Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Ashton. I'm the CEO of the Oceanside Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the Carlsbad, Oceanside, and Vista Chambers, I'd like to welcome you to our 49th Congressional District Candidate Forum. I'd like to thank our candidates, Mike Levin and Brian Marriott, for joining us this evening, and the League of Women Voters for serving as our moderators. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Rachel Bell, the CEO of the Vista Chamber of Commerce, to say a few words and introduce our moderator. Rachel? Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening, and thank you to our candidates and to the League of Women Voters for participating this evening. Um, as a woman and a voter, I'm really excited to partner with the League of Women Voters uh, on events like this. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Mary Crowley. Mary, take it away. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of North County, San Diego, I would like to add our welcome as well. And thank you for being with us for this virtual candidate forum for the Office of Representative for the 49th Congressional District. As <clears throat> Rebecca said, my name is Mary Crowley and I'm from the League and I will be the moderator for this forum. Before we start, I'd just like to take a moment to say a few words about the League. The League of Women Voters is an organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. The League, like the 19th Amendment, is celebrating its 100 year anniversary this year. And even though we've been around for a long time, here we are staying current and tackling Zoom. Speaking of Zoom, I'd like to acknowledge our media coordinator, League member Nancy Telford, who has worked tirelessly to get us all up to speed. You know, one of the most misunderstood things about League is that although we are a political organization, <clears throat> excuse me, we are nonpartisan. So what do I mean by that? We do not endorse or oppose candidates or political parties. The advocacy arm of the League, however, may take positions on issues the League has studied. This forum, however, is presented by the education arm of the League, which does not take positions or advocate. advocate excuse me. The, <clears throat> the League of Women Voters moderates forums like such as this one all over the country, using a format that most people find fair, balanced, and informative. The candidates and sponsors have all agreed to participate under these guidelines. We are asking the candidates also to defer from any personal attacks, but rather keep to the issues of the position and the campaign. Our goal is to get as many of your questions answered as possible. We are recording this forum and we'll be posting it on our new YouTube channel, LWV North County San Diego YouTube. It will also be posted on all three chambers websites. Video recorded, recorded streaming of this forum is limited to authorized entities only and must be shared in its entirety as per FCC regulations. Unlike when we were live, questions for this forum have been solicited in advance from the community, from our league and all the chambers. The question sorters have screened the questions just to avoid duplication, anything derogatory and ones not rele relevant to this election. They've also organized the questions into categories of similar nature to assure topics of the greatest interest are being asked within the time available. The screen is for this forum are League members Nancy Hand and Ronnie C. Ronnie is also the timer for the forum and she will now demonstrate how the timing works because although we on the panel can see the timing, you, you in the viewing audience will not. So Ronnie, if you will introduce yourself and show everyone our infamous paddles. Hi, everybody. I'm the timer tonight. And when the candidate reaches 30 minutes to the end of his presentation, I'll hold up a big sign saying 30 seconds. And then when it's time to stop, um, he'll see the big sign and stop. Um, I won't say a word throughout. If uh, you run over, Mary will gently say, will you please stop, Mr. So-and-so. So anyway, it's, it's nice to be here and good luck to all the candidates. Thanks, Ronnie. So now let's begin. So candidates, you've probably heard this a hundred times if you've been Zooming, but please silence your cell phones and mute yourself when not speaking. And although we know it can be very, very difficult, please adhere to the time constraints. <clears throat> As mentioned previously, this forum is for the Office of Representative for the 49th Congressional District. The term is two years. The candidates are Brian Marriott and Mike Levin. And now the rules of the road. Candidates will have two minutes for their opening, two minutes for their closing, and one minute to respond to each question. 
the candidates already know this, but we'd like you to know as well that this is a forum and not a debate. An extra time for rebuttal is not provided. I think you'll get sick of hearing me say this, but once again, our goal is just to get as many of your questions answered as possible. We will alternate who answers each question first. Prior to the start of this event, the order of speaking was determined randomly. Mr. Levin will go first for the opening statements and will go last for the closing statements. So now we're going to go on to the questions. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Mr. Levin, that you have time for the opening statement. You have two minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mary, for moderating. Thank you to the League for uh, all their wonderful work. And I want to thank our three great chambers. It's really been an honor uh, to get to work with you over these last few years. And we have done a lot uh, to demonstrate bipartisan progress and bipartisan leadership in the 49th Congressional District during the past two years. A lot of things that hadn't happened for a long time uh, that are finally coming to fruition. I'm very honored to serve as the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity, particularly during this time, time of COVID when we've got so many veterans who are at risk of homelessness or are looking for work. Uh, we have passed 12 bipartisan bills. I've introduced 20 with my colleagues. 12 of them have passed. Four of them have been signed into law uh, by President Trump. Very honored by that. I hope we get to speak more about veterans issues tonight. Also very honored that we got to work as a regional a bipartisan group on finally cleaning up the pollution in the Tijuana River Valley. As part of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, we got $300 million for our region. We also got about $250 million for our Marines and sailors at Camp Pendleton. It's an incredible honor to get to serve them. Uh, it's all about their readiness and preparation. We're going to do everything we can to support the troops and our military families at Camp Pendleton. We've also gotten tens of millions of dollars to protect our coastline and uh, for coastal erosion and to protect our bluffs. We've got one of the most strategi strategically important rail corridors in the United States, the Low Sand Rail Corridor. We've gotten 11.5 million for that. And Army Corps projects that have been on hold for decades are now moving forward. We've been able to demonstrate that bipartisan leadership in collaboration with you, our three local chambers of commerce. And really we have an amazing community, an amazing district. Times are tough right now, but we're gonna get back on our feet. We're gonna crush the virus. And that'll help us get back on track for a healthy economy in the years ahead. Thanks again for having us. And I look forward to a great discussion tonight. Thank you. Mr. Marriott. Well, thank you, Mary, and good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss issues with freshman rep Mike Levin. As an aside, I do want to just express my disappointment with his year-long gamesmanship and avoiding debates. And it's odd that Mike didn't seem to think he owed that courtesy to the residents of the 49th before ballots arrived. This has been a troubling and challenging year for our region and our country. It's not been helped by hyper-partisanship, career politicians and elected officials determined to go to Congress in pursuit of Twitter followers and political celebrity status. When we were most in need of true collaboration and compromise, Representative Levin spent time and political capital on the advancement of dangerously reckless ideas like government-run health care, national economic suicide pacts with catchy names like the Green New Deal, reimagining policing in ways that will most certainly make us and our families less safe and using taxpayer money to fund his reelection. When times got tough, Mike was silent. While our businesses were shuttered, our students were sent home and our brave law enforcement came under attack. He even gave up his vote to a proxy in Michigan because apparently he didn't think the job of Congress is essential. Mike is not an environmental attorney. He's a lobbyist and party activist turned politician and he's hell bent on pushing families and seniors onto government-run health care, terminating TRICARE for our retired veterans, and unleashing outrageous new taxes on every Californian, small business owners, and our largest employers as he caters to the most extreme wings of his party. I won't head to Washington for a career. I've had mine 25 years helping families and employers plan and build their financial futures. I'll go to Congress to serve. I'll bring a finance background Congress is in desperate need of and lead with common sense. I was proud to sign the term limits pledge, and I'd be proud to be a strong voice for ending the kind of political obstructionism that comes from career politicians. There are areas of need in our country where the stakes are high, and they demand we put the name calling aside and get back to work. I look forward to leading the way. Thank you. 
we're going to start with the questions now. And I do look forward to, as we've talked about earlier, that the questions will be answered in terms of your vision, your goals, and what you would what you would like to do uh, in, in the office. So and, and, uh, just, just to be clear, you, you told us both to keep it positive, right? Yes. So we're going to, we're going to keep it positive from this point on. I know I just have a good feeling about that. So Mr. Levin, you're gonna answer the question first. And the first question is, how do we prevent drones from degrading the quality of life in our neighborhoods by flying in our airspace and infringing on our privacy and peace and quiet? Mr. Levin, you have one minute. Well, I certainly think privacy rights are incredibly important. Uh, drones, of course, uh, many of them are manufactured in our district actually for the heavy duty military applications rather than the civilian ones. Uh, but uh, look, I, I think that uh, we've got to balance privacy with security. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, we're looking for common sense and common ground. That's what I've tried to achieve. Uh, I have fully supported uh, our local military, uh, our Marines and sailors and uh, wonderful military families at Camp Pendleton. Uh, very honored to uh, work with our local defense industry, uh, along with our aerospace. I'm a proud member of the California Aerospace Caucus, and we're going to do everything we can to support our local industry, particularly in this time of pandemic. Uh, but I absolutely am concerned about the privacy rights uh, of uh, our individuals throughout the 49th. And uh, I do think that uh, drones are something that are only going to become more common and something that we're going to have to continue to be concerned with uh, in the months and the years ahead. Uh, but as part of the strategic arsenal of the Department of Defense, I think they're an important component. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Marriott. Yeah, Mary, so I'm, I'm not in, in favor of a lot of government regulation, but we do have to stop giving drones a pass at some level. Uh, we have seen as the internet exploded and technology exploded, there's been a little bit of a tendency to be hesitant to step in and put a little guardrails around anything technology related. And we're going to have to take a look at where we might be giving them a little bit too much uh, goodwill. Uh, privacy rights are, are the, the, they're absolute in this country. And we have amazing, uh, just amazing technology that's been helpful to our military, helpful, helpful to some commercial applications and been a whole lot of fun for people with drones. But we have to be pragmatic and think about the impact of people in communities and, and, and make some appropriate rules where necessary. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Mary, you'll start the next question. And the question is, do you support adding an amendment to the Constitution to require an annual balanced budget for the federal government? I do. It's not going to be done overnight, but it's critically important that we do it ultimately. Uh, we are getting to a very, very, we are in a dangerous zone uh, with regard to our country's balance sheet. It's going to have remarkable impact on our children and our children's children if we're not careful. Uh, we are getting perilously close to a range as it regards our cumulative debt uh, re uh, relative to our income level as a country, our GDP, as well as our tax revenue. And it is not inconceivable that sometime in the next couple of decades, we could see credit rating uh, changes for our country, which would be disastrous. Uh, it is time that Congress put the same kind of fiscal discipline between the House at the Capitol Hill and the homes across California where people budget their money accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Well, what I support is a new Simpson Bowl style commission to take a strong look at our revenue and our taxation, but make no mistake, we uh, right now are in the rainy day uh, that we have been worried about for some time. We are facing an unprecedented fiscal crisis right now. We've got 26 million Americans still on unemployment. Of the 22 million jobs, uh, that were lost as a result of this pandemic, about half of them have come back. We cannot turn our back at this moment on the 11 million who are still out of work. We've got to do what it takes to crush this virus so that we can ultimately get our economy back on track. And those are the words of Fed Chairman Jerome Powell. Now, if you want to balance the budget, it might be a good idea to have a Democratic president. The last two that actually tackled the deficit were Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. And Donald Trump ran on the premise that he would eliminate the national debt in eight years. Instead, pre-pandemic, he racked up $3 trillion to the debt, including the 2017 tax bill. People like Brian had no problem when the Republicans passed the tax bill, giving a $2 trillion hole in our debt, where 83% of the benefit went to the top 1%. That's not what we need. We need to take care Thank of people during this pandemic. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Levin, you'll start with this question. I'm going to read it exactly because when I tell you the question that I'm a 22 year old student, I don't think you're going to believe me. So here, I'm a 22 year old student working on transferring from a, a junior college to a four year institution. The cost of school is something that holds me back from applying to certain colleges. What plans do you have to lower the cost of higher education <coughs> that won't burden the taxpayer? Well, I'm a strong supporter of the College Affordability Act, which is a great bill that we've got in the House uh, that will help to alleviate uh, the uh, scourge of student loan debt, which is a bubble waiting to burst uh, in this country. Specifically, I've been trying to focus on educational opportunities for our veterans. Uh, I've worked across the aisle on a number of pieces of legislation, particularly again during this pandemic to help advance those opportunities. One bill is part of our Deliver Act, Dependable Employment, Living Improvements for Veterans Economic Recovery, is with Phil Rowe, who's a Republican from Tennessee, who will provide a 12-month rapid retraining program for our veterans to be able to get back on their feet and get into high-skilled, high-wage jobs during this pandemic. I want to make sure that higher education is something that everyone in this country, not only the wealthy, have access to. And we've got to do everything we can to eliminate the over trillion dollar student loan debt bubble. Unfortunately, both Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump during the 2016 campaign talked about doing something about student loan debt. Donald Trump said he would refinance student loan debt. They've done nothing of the sort. More misre misrepresentations from President Trump, just thank like you. we got representations from Brian. Okay, thank you. Mr. Marriott. Yeah, so we have what 1.5, 1.6 trillion that's gonna bog down our next generation with their career opportunities and their flexibility to make career changes and deploy their uh, diplomas in a way that they, that they a passion that they, area they wanna work in. And that's unfortunate. We're going to have to use all the power of the federal government to create some opportunities for them. Uh, we have to take responsibility as a federal government in this, in this area for what we did to help college and, and university costs explode, roughly doubling in the last 10 plus years. We're, we can use the balance sheet of the federal government creatively to bring the monthly tab down for our, for our graduates by at least 60%, if we're smart about this. We have both private and guaranteed student loans at seven, 8%, 15 year amortizations. We can do so much better for our students and then they can have normal careers because their student loan debt will be roughly what a car payment would be, sort of a down payment on their future. And that's just the tip of it. We also have to use our power with schools and guaranteed loans to see them be more thoughtful in their price increases. Okay, thank you very much. You'll be starting the next question. And this one has to do with the FDA's role. And the question is, to what extent do you support the independent authority of the FDA as a regulatory body in relationship to COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Marriott. Well, the FDA, of course, has a very, very important role. Everybody is on high alert and being asked to do things that are truly Herculean now uh, to get a further handle on this virus. Obviously, the vaccine is the big one. The treatment therapeutics have gotten so much better and individual physicians and hospitals have gotten so much better at understanding how to come out this, how to come at this based on the profiles of individuals who are dealing with it. Uh, but the FDA has, has their, uh, their dictates in this. They're an important agency for us. I hope we get a chance to talk about pharmaceutical prices later where they have a lot of responsibility and a lot to answer for. Uh, but we're going to have to give them pretty, pretty wide leeway here to get where we need to get with this virus and get people to have peace of mind throughout America. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Well, the Trump administration's politicization of COVID-19 has been a disaster and <clears throat> evident with their trying to politically interfere into the release of a vaccine before the FDA is actually able to conduct its phase three trial and have the requisite period between the end of the trial uh, and the results to know whether or not the vaccine is safe. We all want the vaccine as soon as it is available, as soon as it is safe, not one day after that, but not one day before that. When the President of the United States talks about it coming before election day, simply to score political points, I think it's just the latest example of many false promises, many misleading representations from this president. And unfortunately, uh, Brian here is a full Trump acolyte. And if elected to Congress, he'll do what Mitch McConnell tells him, what Donald Trump, if Donald Trump is still there, tells him. I think we can do a whole lot better than that. I think we need to believe in science. 
I think we need to follow the public health experts. That's what I've tried to do on COVID-19. And all you have to do is wear a mask. It's so simple. And you're not wearing that mask for yourself. You're wearing it for those that you care about and those you Thank love. You. Everyone should be wearing the mask. Thank you. I, you're going to think this is quite prophetic, but the next question has to do with two things you've already said, but this is these are the questions, don't forget, from the voters. So this is for you, Mr. Levin, and it is, Brian Marriott states on his website that he has repeatedly asked you to debate with him, but you have not replied. Why? Well, we agreed that we would do a debate on KUSI. However, all we ask is that we have an independent moderator. KUSI would not agree to have an independent moderator, so we did not agree to that debate. We're having a debate or a forum, whatever you want to call it. I think Brian thinks it's a debate. We're doing it right now, and we're going to have another one on Friday. Uh, we also had two joint appearances recently. We had one with the California Association of Retired Americans, where we got to go back and forth a bit. And we had another with the Black American Political Association of California, uh, where we were on there for two and a half hours, and Brian RSVP'd and then no-showed the forum. So this is the uh, silly season of politics, the back and forth of politics. But at the end of the day, I'm very proud of our record. And I hope that we can talk about the substance and our records and my record of bipartisan leadership. Again, introducing 20 bipartisan veterans bills, 12 of them passing the House, four of them becoming law, getting things done with our Army, Army Corps of Engineers, with our local governments working together for the better of our community, particularly during this time of crisis. It's an honor to serve, and that's where I hope we can uh, stick to the discussion. Thank, tonight. thank you. Uh, Mr. Marriott, this question is specifically to you. Um, why does Mr. Marriott feel his supporters need not wear masks? Mary, I'm, Mary, I'm, Mary, I'm sorry. Are we, is the format not, we each address each question? Uh, as I, I just explained, once in a while, because oh. of the voters have asked, they, they say this question is for Mr. Levin. This, so this particular, uh, so I split fine. the this one. I understand, yeah. Okay. So this question is just for you. And yes. it says, why does Mr. Marriott feel it's acceptable to have his supporters not wear masks out in public on the campaign trail, despite a state mandate to do so? Uh, so we are a campaign that is full of youthful enthusiasm and people want to get out there and spread the message. We follow every rule and we have from day one indoors and outdoors. Uh, on occasion, we do have someone uh, that questions us outdoors where the state guidance and rule is if you don't anticipate within being within six feet of someone, uh, you're not required to wear a mask. Uh, sometimes we do just as an extra precaution if we think we're in a tighter spot or someone could, could approach us the way we're situated. Um, so that's the simple answer. We follow every rule and all the guidance and we're pleased to do so. Uh, I wanna use my remaining time to thank Mike for being the first of the evening to call somebody a name and look up Acolyte. I take particular offense, Mike, and I'll look forward to your apology on another day. Your campaign has been reckless. Gentlemen, 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 we're gonna go back to square one and what this is. It is a forum, not a debate. And I think if we all keep in mind, and I know it's hard, I really do, that we it's strictly to get the voters' questions answered. So if time Understood. is spent, if, Understood. Thank if, you. if time is spent, we're, we're gonna lose very precious time. So I, I did not bring my gavel because this wasn't live, but I, I have a very loud voice. So I'm going to really ask you to just stick with the issues and what your vision is and what you wanna do. So, Mr. That. Marriott, this question is for you. You will start this one. What type of legislation do you plan to support regarding the adoption of green technologies such as electric vehicles, solar and wind power, sustainable growth, et cetera? Yeah, we can do so much to uh, encourage uh, renewables and ultimately decarbonize our grid. We have to keep moving that in that direction. Uh, we have to stay away from pain, painful mandates. We have to stay away from ideas that are likely to bankrupt employers, bankrupt families. Uh, that is just political posturing. It's not helpful. Uh, that is the progressive caucus of which my members, my opponent is a, a proud member of. It's very, very problematic. They are so political with this, this issue. It's very, very unfortunate. It's in the way of getting anything done. 
Uh, we, can, uh, we need to extend the tax credits for renewables, the Q45, the recapture. We need to really invest in energy innovation, but we knew, need to do it from a market direction, not a pounding mandates direction. Uh, my wife bought an electric car because she went to the dealership and fell in love with it, not because the hard left told her she needed to have one by next Tuesday. And that's the best way for this to happen. And I will tell you, we are, as a, as a nation per capita, leading the world in greenhouse gas reductions Thank every year. And I'm so proud of that. Thank you. Mr. Levin? Well, I've been at this for 15 years. I'm a proud clean energy advocate and environmental attorney. I sit on the select committee for the climate crisis in the House Natural Resources Committee. And I've been proud to be part of the select committee on the climate crisis action plan, which is the most robust climate action plan that the US Congress has ever produced. It's over 500 pages. You can read it at climatecrisis.house.gov. We've got to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and accelerate sustainability in a number of ways. The way we move goods and people, the way we build buildings, the way we grow food, and the way that we generate electricity. All of it has to happen. And I've actually worked across the aisle. I've got a bipartisan uh, Renewable Energy Development Act bill with Paul Gosar of Arizona. Uh, we're working as hard as we can to actually have the details. And we need details that are commensurate with the science. I didn't hear much from Brian there, and I've looked at the plan that he supports, and there's not much to that plan. I hear a lot of fossil fuel industry talking points. Uh, at the end of the day, we need solutions, and we don't need people that support offshore drilling. Brian can say whatever he wants, but he invested in an offshore oil drilling company called Sea Drill, and that's not what we need for a coastal district like this. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Levin, you're gonna answer stop the next question. Um, and when I ask, well, I'll tell you what the question says. Uh, what is the best way for our nation to provide affordable health care for all? Please be specific. Well, my bedrock principles are that we need to get to quality and affordable access for everyone, that we need to protect coverage for those with pre-existing conditions, 129 million Americans, that we've got to reduce the cost of prescription drugs and hospitalizations. And we've got to end the era where you have to choose between your health care, between your being able to pay for your medical bills and being able to pay for your rent or your groceries. And particularly during the middle of a pandemic, we should not be attacking the Affordable Care Act, undermining coverage for 20 million Americans, including 47,000 in our district alone. That is simply unconscionable. But what do we need to do? Well, I have co-sponsored a number of measures. And when you co-sponsor measures in the House, I have to maybe explain to Brian how this works. When you're part of a caucus or you co-sponsor a measure, it's so that you can be part of the discussion. I know that there are a number of uh, different bills in the House that aren't going to make it uh, to the finish line with President Biden and a Democratic Senate, Democratic House, but you bet I'm going to be there for part of that discussion to weigh in on behalf of the residents of the 49th to get to a good solution, Thank better you. healthcare, not the false promises and the misrepresentations from Brian and from President Thank you. Trump. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Marriott. Yeah, so um, let, me, uh, let me be very, very clear on what I'm not going to do, which is take the position of the Progressive Caucus led by Mike Levin and others who are original co-sponsors of H.R. 1384, a disastrous health care bill that will force our families off private insurance and onto a government-run plan, force our retired veterans to walk away from TRICARE because it goes away and to go on to a government run health care plan and force our elderly Americans off of Mer Medicare and onto a government run health care plan. The notion that we would give a retired military veteran the same status and the same, the same care situation as someone who just arrived in this country two weeks ago is an unconscionable. Mike Levin and his progressive caucus ruin health care in this country and there Please, is no Mr. Marriott, let's stay positive are, and let's hear your plan if you are an original co-sponsor of a bill you are behind that bill and that's simply the case and mike knows this. thank you, thank you. once again i'm going to remind you gentlemen this is not a discussion between the two of you this is to get the questions answered as directly to the voters as possible gonna, mary in fairness i'm going to do everything i can to strengthen our va health care I'm not okay. privatizing. Okay, but remember what we agreed on. This is questions and no, with without a chance to rebuttal. So if that that isn't fair to either one of you if you don't have a chance. And if you use the next question to go back to the old question, we again have lost time for the voters. So I'm going to really ask you to please stick to the issues. So the next one, you both alluded to this, I think. 
Um, do you support efforts to bring down drug prices for the American consumer to levels that other countries are paying for the same medication? And Mr. Marriott, you're up. Yes, and it's very, very important. There are three things really that are problematic with the whole picture. Uh, most problematic with the, is the cesspool that we have, which is the FDA, career lobbyists, and career politicians. They're effectively conspiring just about on the prices of pharmaceutical products. And that's unfortunate and obviously aided and abetted by big pharma. So that's terribly disastrous for our families who are paying these high prices. It's the result of career politicians, unfettered lobbying, and real gamesmanship with the FDA. We have to have the patents to inspire innovation. We've all but solved hepatitis. We have 24 hour time relief insulin. You can get a hip replacement in an outpatient surgery as an outpatient and be walking in two days. That all came in, per in pursuit of profits, but we have to be fair about how we do that. We have the greatest breakthroughs, but we have to about be fair about pricing. And that means some hard conversation and, and, uh, and real collaboration Thank on the you. price of pharmaceutical products. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Well, I was very proud to uh, be part of HR 3's passage in the House. That's the Elijah Cummings Lower Drug Costs Now Act. Uh, that would force uh, the uh, prices for prescription drugs to be negotiated by Medicare, just as they are in many other industrialized countries, uh, to bring the costs in line for our seniors and others who rely on those prescription drugs. And, uh, currently are, are being gouged uh, because of uh, uh, the runaway profits of pharmaceutical companies. On that, Brian and I uh, agree. Uh, but we're actually going to do something about it. Uh, the, the problem is, is that the pharmaceutical lobby has so uh, completely taken control of the Republican Party. Uh, and Brian uh, would see that if, if he saw what I saw every day. I, I see uh, my Republican friends who uh, I think do want to do something about this. HR3 actually has a cap on the out-of-pocket expenses for Medicare Part D as well. Those expenses uh, can be very high for people. Uh, and actually, Senator Grassley in the Senate wants to see a similar cap. So I'm very hopeful we can work uh, in a bipartisan, collaborative way uh, in the new Congress on prescription drug pricing, surprise medical billing. Uh, this is an area where I hope we can find common ground. I think we will. OK, Mr. Levin, you're next. And the question is, what is the most significant issue affecting our district and what are your plans to address it? Well, right now, the most important issue is crushing COVID-19. Uh, that's not just our district, that's all around the United States. And we're gonna do everything we can there. It, it really is very unfortunate that the president unilaterally pulled out of negotiations because I believe we were getting closer. Uh, we were at 2.2 trillion. We just passed a $2.2 trillion bill last week. And Stephen Mnuchin, the treasury secretary was at 1.6. Uh, but look, you know, the president decided to uh, take his ball and go home, and here we are. Uh, I hope we get back on track and have those discussions because people desperately need that help. There are other very specific issues, and I hope we get asked longer questions about things like San Onofre. I've done everything possible to get that waste off our coast as quickly and as safely as we can. I've introduced major legislation that passed the House recently to get half a billion dollars in research and development for spent nuclear fuel. We also have the Spent Fuel Prioritization Act which says for all the nation's nuclear waste, move the waste first from sites like ours with the highest seismic risk and the highest population density. We brought together a task force that produced a 70 page report and I hope you all read it. Hope we get a chance to speak about it some more. Thank you, Mr. Marriott. I think the most important issue for families, for older Californians in our district, for our veterans and our retired veterans is healthcare and the peace of mind about their healthcare their ability to have choices and a fighting chance if they're dealing with something life-threatening. I am gonna very, work very, very hard to defend against the healthcare bill that intends to put all of us on a government-run healthcare plan for the benefit of the people of this district. There are 118 members of Congress led by Mike Levin and a few others that wanna destroy our healthcare system in the name of a government-run system a to Z, and it would be disastrous and our country would never recover from it. And we don't need to do it. We're a gracious nation and a wealthy nation. We will take care of our vulnerable. I have never in my entire life said anything about taking away protection for pre-existing conditions. It was one silver lining of an otherwise badly flawed Affordable Care Act that we're going to need to build on. It's gonna take collaboration and compromise to do so. 
Thank you. That's what they're doing in court right now is they're trying to undermine those pre-existing conditions. That's what the Trump administration is trying to do. Thank you. You, you know, gentlemen, if, if, if you're going to behave, <laughs> you, can, you can answer some of these things in your closing statements when you get two minutes. But I hope it'll. I hope we'll get into a more positive frame of mind. Now, this particular one, I thought these were two good questions because the first one said the most significant issue in our district. Now, this one uh, said, if you could solve one problem in our country, what would that one problem be and how would you solve it? And Mr. Marriott, you're up. Um, I don't know if I would define it as a problem, but it's certainly frightening. Uh, we have given uh, the two political parties and those who register to them uh, colors now. We're, we're the reds and the blues. Uh, we sometimes have people out in the community that ask us how we've got the nerve to use blue on our signs. Uh, it's really become so caustic, so personal and so distressing. At the end of the day, we all want the same things. We want world-class healthcare available to everyone in a way that won't bankrupt them. We want peace of mind about our standing in the world and our ability to lead and inspire the world. We want an economy where everybody can have a job that's productive for them, that's in the field that they work hard to be in. We just have different, very different ideas about the best and smartest path to get us there. And it's becoming incredibly divisive in this country. And like I ran in my city to help bring the temperature down, I'll do my part in DC for that as well. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Well, we've talked about COVID-19, obviously, and we've talked a little bit about climate change. I think those are two ex incredibly important uh, problems that we need to address. But what I would say is, in terms of uh, our political system, getting the dark money out of our campaigns. Uh, I'm a proud member of the End Corruption Caucus. I was endorsed by End Citizens United. Uh, I wanna do everything I can to get the dark money out of politics. And I have taken no corporate PAC money as a candidate, whether in uh, our 2018 race or uh, our 2020 race, and we'll never uh, take corporate PAC money because what I see is for the major issues of the day, like gun violence prevention, why is it that we can't get background checks to pass when we've got 80 or 90% of Americans. Why can't we do anything on climate when solid majorities wanna see that? It is ultimately because of the corrosive nature on money in our politics. You know, we passed HR1, the For the People Act, to address that and foreign interference in our elections, also very important. We sent it to Mitch McConnell. Now, Brian is a maximum contributor to Mitch McConnell. He is a fan of Mitch McConnell. I am not. We'll work together when we can. But on this, McConnell said it was a power grab. Perfect time to tell you your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, and, and you start the next question. And it is, um, do you think that having citizen review committees in our cities should be included in police reform plans? And Mr. Levin, that's yours. Well, I think as part of a discussion between law enforcement and civil rights groups, it is important that we talk about community policing. Uh, I uh, absolutely do not support defunding the police, but what I do support is having a dialogue and trying to bring people together. That's what I have done with the support of law enforcement organizations like the Carlsbad Police Officers Association, the San Diego Police Officers Association, and the Peace Officers Research Association of California, PORAC, which is the largest police association in the United States, 77,000 law enforcement officers. I have tried to bring them to the table with our local civil rights leaders in a productive dialogue around what we need to do uh, to have law and order and law enforcement. Everybody wants security, but we also need to address racial injustice and systematic injustice. Those are not mutually exclusive concepts. I'm very proud that we passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in the House. I wish the Senate would have passed the Justice Act so we could have gone to conference. Simi Mitch McConnell would have allowed that and actually had a productive dialogue and gotten something done for the American people. That's what we need to do. Thank you, Mr. Marriott. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so uh, I will tell you one thing that I am not going to do. Let me be very clear. And that's abandon the men and women who put the uniform on every day to defend our families and our property. And by the way, 20% of them across the country, some 150,000 are doing that for a second career after doing it a first time in places like Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan. Mike Levin was happy to run off to DC in the midst of the riots and sign a, a bill so overreaching that stripped them and their families of qualified immunity, which is something that Mike and I enjoy. 
And when those police officers make a mistake in a split second, it's life and death on the line, not a funding stream or a pothole. It's remarkable that they would do that, the progressive left. It's, it's unfortunate because you need to recruit good people, train them and resource them and hold them accountable. And that's going to make things much more difficult and our neighborhoods less safe. Mr. Marriott, the question was, what do you think about citizen review committees? And I don't know if I heard an answer to that. All right, Mary, I want extra time. Yeah. On no, 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 I'm just, just clarifying. If you need to clarify, I'll get you too. Mary, I'm, honestly, I'm trying to get you all to answer the question. Mary, honestly, if the rebuttals continue, you should really meet, mute the other participant during the one. The one uh, Mr. Minute. Marriott, I'm the moderator. I'm taking care okay, of it. I'm just, I'm just, just, making, I'm just, the opportunity to I'm just making a suggestion because it's getting very difficult. Um, I would have been happy to tell you a minute ago and with some of my time that Mike got elected with dark money last year and that he's been in. Mr. Marriott, this is he, not this is not the way we're going to continue this forum. So I'm really asking you all, you both said in the beginning when we talked, you did not want it to become like the, the presidential debate and right. we're getting awfully close. And I'm, I'm gonna really, really ask, think well, of the voters. It's right. the voters, that these are the, and some yeah. of the questions I know you're- I, I, Mr. I, I, Marriott, I'm speaking. Right. It, and these are the questions, whether you like them or not, or whether you wish we were talking about something else, these are the questions that the most can the most vote is asked for. So this is strictly for your constituents. And and please, let, let's just get back to answering for the voters because sure. when either one of you are negative, the other person, and rightly so, wants a chance to uh, to have a, re, a rebuttal. And I'm not going to allow it. So you can you know hoop and holler all you want. It's not going to happen. So we're going to start again and on a positive note. And Mr. Marriott, the next question is yours. And this one says, um, again, it's, I'm going to quote it directly. In order to earn my vote, uh, I must know your position on racism. Please make a definitive policy statement about white supremacy, armed white hate groups, and systemic racism. Please include anti-Semitism. Please be specific. Mr. Marriott. Sure. So uh, I think it's sad, very sad that in our country's collective heart, there is still some racial bias. Uh, it is it's something that everybody has to look inside their heart and decide how they're going to deal with it and challenge themselves. Uh, it's 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 unfortunate that in our country at this point in time that still exists. Um, white supremacy groups or, or groups that, you know, think they are somehow supreme in some way. Uh, that inspire violence or talk about violence or demeaning to others are disgraceful and uh, and should be ashamed of themselves and we should have zero tolerance for them. Uh, I think we should let the pot melt. Uh, we are all Americans. We're all human beings. And I think it's unfortunate that um, that we're we're feeling as a nation uh, that this is getting so this is getting so acute now. Uh, but uh, I, I can't. Uh, more adamantly denounce any kind of white supremacy and that kind of thing. It's simply unhelpful and it's shameful. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Well, I absolutely agree, Mary. I denounce hatred in all its forms. Uh, white supremacy has no place in our society. Uh, was deeply disturbed at the president's equivocation uh, at last week's debate. I worry also about any immigrant rhetoric, any Semitic rhetoric, it is extremely personal to me. You would not know this by looking at me or by my last name, but my grandparents on my mom's side were immigrants from Mexico. They came here with very little money, with no formal education. They didn't even speak English, but they believed in this country. They were able to do very well, working hard. I worry that that dream is dying if we don't treat our immigrants with decency and respect. My grandfather served in World War II in the Army Air Corps, a Jewish American, a proud, Jewish American. And I worry about anti-Semitic anti rhetoric, anti-Semitism in our country uh, that unfortunately has gotten worse under this administration. My grandfather fought for the right for others to peacefully protest. He told me so before he passed away. And I know if my grandfather were here, he would say Black Lives Matter. He would say we must do better. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Um... Now, gentlemen, this, this should be nice and easy and we can both, good opinions on this one. But 
do you support adding Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico as states to the United States, Mr. Levin? Well, we voted to add Washington, D.C. as a state this past year, and I've actually uh, been to Puerto Rico and spoken to people who were devastated by Hurricanes Maria and Irma, and ultimately they have a right to self-determination. They've got a plebiscite. Uh, and I believe that in the polling I've seen that uh, very likely a, a majority, a, a large majority of Puerto Ricans want to be a state. Let us not forget that we've got uh, over 3.2 million Puerto Ricans. They're Americans uh, and we ought to treat them with the respect and the dignity and provide them with the resources that they deserve. And as far as Washington DC goes, all you had to do is look at the militarization of peaceful protests at Lafayette Square, the unbelievable behavior of the administration uh, in the midst of a peaceful protest to know as uh, Mayor Bowser said, that enough is enough. This isn't what our founders intended. And the District of Columbia being uh, made a state along with Puerto Rico, uh, I think uh, would go a long way towards appropriate representation. But ultimately Puerto Rico will have to make uh, their own determination on that uh, because of the history there. Thank you, Mr. Marriott. I do not. Oh, okay. <laughs> is, that your is that your final answer? It is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, the next question is, um, the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act lowered the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. Since our federal deficit is at an historic high, would you favor raising the tax on corporations? Please explain your answer. Mr. Marriott. Uh, no, I would not. So we have to remember that uh, these are our largest employers. Uh, when the tax reform uh, passed in 2017 and finally brought uh, rates in line with some global competition for our biggest employers. We saw amazing things happen. We saw so many Fortune 500 companies expand their maternity leaves, increase and, and introduce family uh, leave, introduce uh, in, increase pension contributions, 401k contributions, uh, expand tuition reimbursement plans, grow our economy, start new divisions, start new products. And, uh, and it's had an amazing impact prior to this body blow of COVID. We had a historic job market for everybody in California and everybody in America. And it was long overdue tax relief for our employers. The idea that the government could ever spend money in a more productive way for residents and their opportunities than our employers, small, medium, large, is not economically sound. Thank you. Mr. Levin. Well, Brian is on record as wanting to embrace another Trump tax cut, but let's be clear about this. A lot of Republican senators, Republican economists want to see that corporate rate back up. I know that Vice President Biden has proposed 28%. That's a discussion that we'll have, but the most onerous parts of the Trump tax bill uh, need to be repealed. And one I would focus on is the state and local tax deduction being capped at $10,000. That was a horrible blow to the working families of the 49th district. 43% of the families in our district take the state and local tax deduction. On average, they deduct $24,000. And by capping that deduction at $10,000, that hurt so many working families in our district, not just wealthy families, 86,000 people, families that took that deduction, deduction made less than $100,000 a year. And in an area like ours, where the average price of a home is around $750,000, that mortgage interest deduction being capped that hurt as well. That's why I'm proud to have the endorsement of our realtors because they know I'll fight for them and I'll fight for our working families in our district to reverse the most onerous provisions. Brian called the salt pennies on the dollar. Thank it's you. not. Thank you. Um, and you will be first on the next question, Mr. Levin. What is your position on congressional term limits and why? Well, I believe that we have an erosion of the legislative branch right now and we see the executive branch running roughshod over the legislative branch. And studies have determined that congressional term limits, well, in theory, a great idea, sounds like a great idea, at the end of the day would lead to a further erosion of the legislative branch. I also think that it's ironic that uh, Brian is the one talking about it when he's the one who served in government longer than I have. I do think that you gain relevant experience. I've only been in Congress uh, a little under two years, but I do think you get better uh, at the job as you go. And ultimately the voters determine every two years whether you should stay or whether you should go. And I hope we'd all be self-aware enough to recognize that. Uh, I absolutely uh, enjoyed my career as a clean energy advocate, environmental attorney, working in uh, clean energy businesses. I've also enjoyed my opportunity to serve our community. Uh, I think it's important 
uh, that we protect the power of the legislative branch at a time when it's been under attack as never before by this out of control administration. Thank you, Mr. Marriott. So politics in DC has become in a word rancid. It is, it is awful to watch. There's not that much that ails our country, but there's so many areas we can go from very good to great and then on to exceptional. There are a handful of key areas and the people standing in the way, the obstructionists are career politicians. And in the Democrat party and the progressive wing that Mike's a part of, they put forward a bill that would allow them to get on average three to 5 million in taxpayer dollars for their own reelection efforts every two years. They call it the For the People's Act. I call it the For the Politicians Act. I'm proud to fight for term limits because what's going on in DC is healthcare is getting ignored, tax and economic policy is getting ignored, bringing some thoughtful, compassionate, but firm immigration reform is getting ignored. And it's getting ignored because of people who've been in office 20, 30 years, and now they wanna feed that machine with millions of dollars out of, the tax, out of the pockets of taxpayers. It's disgraceful, it's rancid. I'm proud to support term limits and I'm gonna be a loud voice for it. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Marriott, your next and the question is, you both I think have alluded to this, what steps would you recommend we take to mitigate San Onofre's nuclear waste issue? How can the waste be disposed of? So Mary, this is the greatest domestic policy failure of our time. Uh, since the 80s, we've been trying to get a deep mountain repository. Nothing, nothing, not science, not a lack of funding. Nothing has stood in our way except politics. We spent $15 billion studying that site. I look forward to joining the legislative efforts of Scott Peters and others that are thinking about this in a balanced way and recognizing that we need a deep mountain repository while there was a another task force going on in this district by our freshman congressman studying things that have been studied 10 times over, laughably unsuccessful, the last canister was being buried. And it's, been, it's buried at 35 other states around this country. And until we get politics out of the way, get a deep mountain repository, we will not have relief on this. We may need some for-profit companies involved in interim storage, but what we really need is a deep mountain repository Mike sadly is on record as saying that he doesn't think it's fair to put it all in one state. And that just fundamentally misses the effort that's gone on for the last few decades. Thank you, Mr. Levin. It'd be great for Brian to speak with Scott Peters who's worked with me for the last two years and would acknowledge my leadership on this issue. We brought together uh, the experts in the field, the former head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, a retired Navy Admiral. They came together, they worked for over a year. They put together a 70 page task force report I'd love for our viewers to actually read the report. I think we've done more on this issue in the last two years than my predecessor did in the 18 years prior. And it's not gonna be easy to get this waste off the coast quickly or easily. The challenge is actually true that we lack a permanent geologic repository. Uh, I've actually been there. I've toured Yucca Mountain in Nevada with Scott Peters and with Republicans too. Uh, and there are political uh, headwinds. There's no question about that. Those headwinds also now come from Governor Abbott of Texas, who just wrote in opposition uh, to a consolidated interim storage site. But the biggest person standing in the way of Yucca Mountain is actually Donald Trump right now, who said that he did a, a 180 on this. He said initially that he was open to it, but then I think uh, Sheldon uh, Adelson, his friend uh, who runs many of the casinos in Nevada said, no thanks. So we need research and development. We got $500 million passed through the House just a couple of weeks ago. We're holding the nuclear regulatory to account in a way that had never been done before. And I feel very confident we've made substantive progress despite more misleading Thank statements from Brian. Thank you. Uh, you will have the next question, Mr. Levin. What federal legislation is necessary to mitigate future fire disasters in California? Well, in our select committee on the climate crisis report, we have a series of measures on wildfire management. Now, one of the things that's very important to understand is that a lot of the land uh, that uh, has been burning in California, now over 4 million acres and counting, is federal land. So if Donald Trump is mad about wildfire management, he needs to look at his own uh, wildfire management uh, officials. Uh, and there's no question we need to change the way uh, that we conduct business. But we also need to do all we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because we know that there is incontrovertible evidence, overwhelming evidence that climate change is leading to these extreme temperatures, to these drought conditions and to these fires. Uh, all you had to do is look at 60 Minutes the other night, they asked a scientist, just how uh, settled is the science on this? And he said, well, it's about like 
scientists believe in gravity. That's about what they think of climate change now. So uh, we need to stop delays and distractions and the fossil fuel industry talking points that Brian likes to, uh, to repeat. And we need to focus on solutions. That's what I will do as part of the select committee and as part of the natural resources committee. We're going to- Thank get you. It. Mr. Marriott. Yeah, so California, our biggest issue that we have right now is we are in the midst of a very, very difficult drought, not the worst in our state's history. There have been worse. There have been longer. Uh, this one's just been fairly persistent with only a brief interruption and has impacted hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of acres. Uh, we have a management issue at the state level. We have an execution level at the uh, issue at the federal level. Uh, we do have the Interior Department and Federal Bureau of Land Management that has not done the right job on that, and I will hold their feet to the fire. I will also fight to influence politics in a way that starts to get us some business people in Sacramento, uh, and we have not, frankly, had anybody with meaningful business background in the governor's office for 20 years now. We're going to need that because we can't keep going like this. We have to put the, the nonsense talk aside, the hyperbole aside, acknowledge the real causes and get to work at real land management and water in this state, which is our next greatest challenge. And our next congressman is going to have to partner with either administration. Thank and you. I will do just that. Thank you. Uh, you're next. And it is the question is, Mr. Marriott, in your opinion, in your opinion, what are the most promising jobs slash areas of employment that you see for the future of our country? You know, our, our economy, Mary, is so diverse and technology is so remarkable that I think the most exciting jobs that, that are out there are the ones that our young people dream about and want to work in. There is just no area of technology that, is, it is, that has been fully explored. Uh, there is no line of business or product uh, that has been overdone. Uh, it, there is, our young people can dream big. And as long as we don't push down a socialist route with our country, handing 35% of our economy to the federal government, which is what Mike would do, uh, we, our kids can dream big and work in the field and forge new fields and new products and new ideas and also noble ways to serve, whether it's putting coalitions together to help folks who are struggling with addiction and and, and hope, homelessness and heartbreak, or wanting to be entrepreneurs and, and start an Instagram business or whatever the case may be. So it's what they dream of. That's what I'm so excited about in our country, the future of our young people. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Well, I wanna thank our Carlsbad, Oceanside and Vista Chambers for uh, all of their collaboration. We've got some great industries that are growing right now in the 49th, whether it be our life sciences, our information technology, biotechnology, but a, a couple that I'm very uh, interested in, obviously clean energy jobs. The estimates that if uh, we actually accelerate the transition uh, to more sustainable energy, we will create 25 million jobs in the United States by 2050. I think our district and region are incredibly well positioned to lead as those jobs are created. Uh, and also uh, our coastal tourism, our ocean economy right now in our region, $7.7 .7 billion a year in economic impact 140,000 jobs. It's been devastated by COVID-19, uh, but we have to do all we can to protect our bluffs, secure our coastline. That's why the resources we've gotten from the Army Corps in collaboration with our local cities is so important. It's why we've got to fight offshore drilling as well. And I looked David Bernhardt, our Interior, Interior Secretary in the face. I said, what guarantee do you have that you won't drill off our coast? He said, I'm going to follow the law which is a bad sign. We've got to fight offshore Thank drilling. You. We'll do it. Our opponent invested in it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Levin, this question is for you to start. How would you work to increase affordable housing in the district? Well, housing today takes up far greater a percentage uh, in terms of people's income than it should, 30, 40, 50%. So a variety of things that we have to do. Uh, one is we've got to fully fund the Section 8 program. It's been dramatically underfunded. Uh, under Secretary Ben Carson. Uh, number two is we have to have refundable and advanceable tax credits, both for renters and for uh, people who are looking to buy a home, whether they're first home or whether they're looking to uh, get a new home. We've got to eliminate that salt cap in the $750,000 mortgage interest deduction, uh, because that, according to the realtors who have endorsed me, that is a very big issue for our home buyers. 
And then also our veterans. I have looked at this entire issue through the lens of our veterans. We need more affordable housing for our veterans. I'll do everything I can to fight for another veterans village in North San Diego. I said that to VA Secretary Wilkie, we're gonna work very hard. And I was honored to work with Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader as part of our Deliver Act that we passed a couple of weeks ago to fully utilize HUD VA supportive housing vouchers for our veterans. Thank you. Mr. Marriott. So the, what's going to uh, require uh, to be done for affordable housing is to recognize that we have an issue in this state that's holding us back in creating affordable housing. Uh, it's very, very difficult to get housing done that uh, between the cost of land, the regulation in the, in the state of California, when you buy a new home, you're paying about 50% of that new price has to do with regulations. That's how awful it's become in California. And that's why so many of our home builders are leaving California, but we're going to have to be creative and uh, provide new ways to leverage resources to get uh, low income housing done. We did it in my city, two major projects I'm so excited about, uh, but our veterans need so much more than that to get off the streets and so do ours folks who are badly addicted. Um, it's gonna take much more than that. We have to get our arms around them and there's so much work to be done there. But uh, we have a business issue with regard to affordable housing and it's gonna take business-like principles and getting government out of the way to solve that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, this is going to be our last question. And then um, I, I've saved one that is related to COVID because I think as I mentioned before that we did have an awful lot of questions as you might expect related to COVID. So uh, this is the question and Mr. Merritt, you'll be leading the question. Going forward, what efforts will you support in the House of Representatives to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting issues in the US health system and the economic and educational fallout? So the first thing that we must do is get liability protection for all of our employers, small, medium, and large. Uh, the progressives have been unwilling to do that. Mike and Nancy Pelosi have been unwilling to do that. It's so simple to do, and it's so necessary to do. There are so many people that could be back at the office, small businesses that could be open again. They, they have uh, suffered so much, they're hemorrhaging. Let's give them some relief. Let's look at the programs administered from the SBA. Let's look at those who are truly deserving from this point forward for debt relief and perhaps more capital and more access to capital. That's so critically important. I will tell you from working with them for years, small business owners pour their life savings into their business and they reinvest their profits for years and they often build no savings or investments in another, in another area. So they are losing so much. They're telling me their stories through tears and it's tragic. Uh, what it's demonstrated in our healthcare system is the need, the critical need to stay away from any catastrophic ideas that the government could run it better. Thank you. Mr. Levin. We need to listen to the scientists first and foremost. I've had 44 virtual town halls since the middle of March, a lot of them with epidemiologists and experts from UCSD. Uh, and overwhelmingly what they've said is we've got to get this virus under control and they've said exactly how we do it. We wear a mask, uh, we socially distance, we do all we can to follow those protocols. You can't have a healthy economy unless you have healthy people. The sad thing is we were working on a bipartisan basis four bipartisan bills beginning in March, $8 billion for a vaccine turned out to be pretty important uh, for Operation Warp Speed as it's been known. Middle of March, 200 billion for the Families First Act end of March, $2.2 trillion for the CARES Act. Uh, and then at the end of uh, April, uh, another 500 billion for more money for small businesses, more money for hospitals. Middle of March, we passed the HEROES Act, 3.4 trillion. The Senate, Mitch McConnell, they sat on it through May, June, July, August. We came back with 2.2 trillion. The administration was at 1.6. If you look at what is in our HEROES Act 2.0, it has the money to crush the virus. It has the money for state and local. It's so critically important we get this done. Trump should not have unilaterally pulled out. We Thank have to get it done to save lives and to save livelihoods. Thank you. Uh, before we go to our, 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 our closing statements, our candidates, before our candidates, excuse me, before our candidates give their closing statements, I want to first thank you all for asking such good questions. It's obvious that there was a lot of interest in this election. We had over 100 questions submitted.
By the way, if you would like to become involved with the men and women helping make democracy work for everyone, it's really, really easy to join the league. We encourage you to visit our website, my.lwv.org and click on North County. We also encourage you to visit votersedge.org. It's a fabulous website, one-stop shopping for nonpartisan information about the candidates, ballot issues, and detailed voting information. This website also tracks the financing of the ballot measures, which can be often, as we know, very, very informative. The San Diego Registrar's of Voters has a, a wonderful website as well, sdvote.com. It's a great resource for getting additional information about the election. And by putting in your address, you can access your personal ballot. You can also track your ballot with the option, where's my ballot? It's kind of like tracking your Federal Express package. It can show you exactly where your mail-in ballot is. This is just another way to gain confidence in the mail-in ballot system. I'm pretty sure we all know the election is November 3rd, <laughs> but there are a few other dates you might want to remember. The deadline to register to vote is October 19th. If you have moved, changed your name, or wish to change your party affiliation since you last registered, you need to re-register. Online voter registration is available at the Registrar of Voters website, again, sdvote.com. It's both secure and easy. If you do miss the October 19th deadline, you may register conditionally and vote provisionally in person at the San Diego Registrar's office in Kearney Mesa or at any of the county vote centers beginning Saturday, October 31st and until eight o'clock on election day, November 3rd. But if you just can't wait, early voting at the Registrar's office has already started. And please remember, it's easy, secure, and convenient to vote by mail. Now the candidates will make their closing statements. We will reverse the order that we began with. <clears throat> Mr. Marriott, you will start. Well, thank you, Mary, and thanks again for spending time with us this evening, and also to everybody who worked hard to make tonight's forum possible. Throughout the night, we've been hearing from two candidates with very different ideas about the role of government and what represents smart policy and leadership for our future. Along with other members of his progressive caucus, it's clear we can count on Mike to continue to advocate for big government and the usual restrictions on our freedom this brings. We heard a lot tonight about task forces and commissions and little sums of money that have been scored in one part of government with no hope of ever getting through the rest of government. All kinds of ideas that can be done with big, big government stuff all going nowhere like spinning wheels and all from somebody who spent 15 years in renewable energies, but doesn't have solar heat in his own home. I find all of it hypocritical and I find it nonsense politics, quite frankly, just more of the same. And that's what we're gonna get if we stay with the same. Mike's support for universal minimal income for every resident and his proposals for the government to run nearly 35% of our economy places him squarely in the emerging socialist progressive wing of the Democrat party. That's not what the communities of this district need. Individuals, families, employers in our community need representation in Congress that is far more congruent with our common sense values and simple desires. To raise our families in safe neighborhoods, get our kids off to college without being overwhelmed by debt, build a thriving business and have peace of mind that if life throws us a health related challenge, we'll have unfettered access to the world's greatest healthcare system without government bureaucrats, inefficiency and apathy getting in our way. I'll be with you in that journey, fighting for parents, employers, veterans and older Americans, working to keep government partnering alongside you as needed on occasion, but never mandating your choices or obstructing your dreams. I'll take all my finance experience, management experience and life's learning and advocate for you on a strong foundation of common sense. We're proud to have the endorsements of our deputy sheriffs, Oceanside Police, our sheriff, and the mayors of Dana Point, San Clemente, Carlsbad, Oceanside, and Vista. They recognize that the leadership and common sense will bring back to the seat, will benefit all of us for years to come. I look Thank forward to working hard for our communities. Good night. Thank you. Mr. Levin. Well, I'm grateful first and foremost to you, Mary, for moderating. I'm grateful to the league, and I'm uh, really thankful for uh, our three great uh, chambers here that, that helped put this together. I also want to thank my amazing wife, Chrissy, uh, and our two wonderful children, Jonathan and Elizabeth, who go to our local public schools here. 
Uh, you know, if you just look at the national news, it'd be easy to think that Washington is so fundamentally broken that you can't get anything done. But I'm here to tell you that's simply not the case. What doesn't make the news is the work that we do in our committees day in and day out, trying to serve our communities, trying to serve our districts. I've been very honored to chair a subcommittee as a freshman. Uh, that is not a, uh, a common thing for veterans economic opportunity with jurisdiction uh, over the GI Bill and transition assistance and homelessness and housing for our veterans and so much. And I've been so grateful to, again, introduce 20 bipartisan bills uh, in that committee. 12 of them have passed the House, four of them have become law. That's as much as any other freshman, I think, uh, in terms of President Trump signing uh, laws uh, written by freshmen. Uh, but one of those that I think has another shot of becoming law this year, because it's bipartisan, it's bicameral, is called the DELIVER Act, Dependable Employment and Living Improvements for Veterans Economic Recovery. I worked with half a dozen Republicans on this bill, pieces of it uh, to improve the HUD VA supportive housing voucher program were done with Kevin McCarthy. Uh, parts were done with my good friend, the ranking member, Gus Bilarakis, Republican of Florida, uh, to uh, expand VA services, uh, provide them with flexibility during this pandemic. Uh, parts of it for women, house, uh, women homeless uh, veterans, which is a, a horrible trend with my friend, Republican Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania. Uh, parts with uh, Dr. Phil Rowe, Republican of Tennessee, and the list goes on. My point with this is that Washington still can work. And I'm proud that my voting record reflects my values in our district. It places me squarely in the center of the Democratic caucus, according to every independent analysis. I'm proud to represent this district, and I'll do it for as long as I can. And I'm grateful to my wife for putting up with it uh, these last Thank couple of crazy years. Thank, Thank you for having me, everybody. Okay. Thank you. So on behalf of the Chambers and the League of Women Voters of North County, San Diego, I want to commend the candidates for running for elected office. It's not easy. And for their participation in this forum. And thank you all for getting involved and not being just a voter, but an informed voter. So thanks so much for joining us. Brett? Yeah, I want to... Um... Thank everybody for uh, watching this video. Just the fact that you took the time to watch this means you care. And we three chambers, Oceanside Vista and Carlsbad, we all take very seriously our responsibility to help educate voters on uh, the policies and, and the uh, beliefs of our various candidates. So thank you for watching. Thank you so much to our candidates for taking the time, the League of Women Voters for partnering with us. Mary, great job moderating. And again, everybody get out there and vote. Um, and Check your uh, chambers, local websites as well. I know Mary's talking about the league has a great website, but um, oceansidechamber.com, vistachamber.org, and carlsbad.org. We all have held multiple candidate forums and different things on local and as well as now congressional levels. So check our sites out. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Good night.